Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us here on the ice. KSTV, our part one, Wayne Bo, brought to you by Case Financial, Dokes Book Fuels, Toby Hockey, and the Pilot Mountain Hockey Academy. Wayne Kozier from the confides of his beautiful basement, I believe it is. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you, Wayne, as always. Thanks for joining me again on the ice. Uh, three really great topics to discuss, and it's getting exciting. It's not just the snow melting outside or falling currently. It's the fact that it's come playoff time, and we're in the middle of some playoff races that we definitely need to discuss. Let's discuss, start off with our Junior A playoffs in Saskatchewan. Uh, quite a big tilt going on tonight. Game 7 between Melfort and the Yorkton Terriers. Tell me what you like about this series and why it's gone to seven games. Well, you know, first of all, I mean, nothing like a game seven in the playoffs. Eh? It's uh, I love those games, and that's what, uh, you know, playoff hockey is all about. But, you know, I, I think the key, uh, Melford's got some injuries, a couple of injuries, I think, that has maybe changed things a bit. And Yorkton was coming on. They got a good team. Uh, you know, uh, they weren't that far apart in the standings. Uh, so, again, not too big of a surprise. I mean, obviously, Melford's favored, but it'll be uh, – you know, they'll be at home tonight, so again, probably the favorites, but I'm sure it's going to be a good battle, and I look forward to tuning in a little bit to that on Hockey TV. Yeah, that's coming down right after this show is over, so it should be a good tilt to watch. The other three series have already been settled. Were there any surprises? I mean, we clearly both of us discussed in last week that we were expecting to see the Estevan Burns and the Humboldt Broncos finish up, and they did in five, but yeah. seeing the Flint Flon Bobbers do what they did to Battleford, was that expected as well? Yeah, that's no big surprise. I mean, they were the four or five team, so it's always close. And they were only a couple points apart. So uh, playing in Flin Flon has always been a tough rink. And so, uh, you know, that's probably a big part of the difference there. Uh, so, again, not a big upset there. Could have went either way. As far as Estevan, Notre Dame, I mean, that was a mismatch, that series, uh, first versus eighth. And so that was uh, pretty much a beat down. And then uh, LaRange and Humboldt, uh, surprisingly tough. And, again, uh, Kevin Kaminsky up there, the former NHLers, does a good job getting those guys ready for playoffs. And, you know, they they were tough. And uh, it was a great series. And, uh, you know, Humboldt took the last couple of games to take it in six. But, you know, there was, uh, you know, a point I was thinking that might go seven games, which would have been a real surprise. Absolutely. Do you want to go east or go west? Where do you want to go do next, Wayne? Let's go east to Manitoba. Your, your home country, man. They finally started playing playoffs. I mean, it took them a little while to get going, but they are a couple of games in each. Uh, uh, Dauphin and Swan Valley playing their game two tonight at 7.30 as well. But Winkler and the uh, Blues, the uh, Selkirk Steelers and Steinbach Pistons are both knotted up at ones. Verdon and Weiwei Sakapo. Verdon, like you mentioned last week, that dark horse team having a 2-0 lead against Weiwei Sakapo. That's not a surprise to you, Wayne. Yeah, you know, I'm going to take my buddy to Vegas, I think, because uh, he gave me that tip. And it was funny when we talked, he said, watch out for Verdon. Uh, they're going to be a dark horse and make some upsets. And, you know, he, he thought they could even make it right to the final. So it's going to be interesting to see. And, you know, again, when I seen they're up 2 nothing in that series, uh, it was kind of uh, uh, revealing, I guess. We did mention a week or so ago regarding the energies that are back in the stands when it comes to junior A and playoff hockey. Clearly, We've seen some numbers and spectators grow and we still see numbers not as big as we once do. But if you do have that opportunity to support junior A hockey in your communities, please, by all means, get out there and get to the rinks because this is some good hockey. And this is probably a playoff series that we've been expecting to see for over two years now because we right. didn't have hockey for quite a while. So, like I said, just in the beginning of their series here in Manitoba, just two games apiece in each of the prospective series. But Nonetheless, they should be ramping up very, very soon this weekend. Let's head west. Uh, let's talk about the AJ. Uh, any surprises you've seen so far moving forward in their second round into their third? Well, the only one is the Drumheller has given the Okotoks a good run for the money. They're playing game six tonight, and, uh, you know, there's been a two or three overtime games, and uh, Okotoks leads that three games to two. And so that's been a bit of a surprise because Drumheller had a struggle knocking out Calgary in the first round. So, uh, they've obviously uh, came on, and I think they had one or two guys out to injury the, in that first series, so a different team when they got all of the bodies in the lineup. So that's really about the only big surprise that, that, that I know of. I mean, uh, uh, Brooks, not surprisingly, swept Canmore. Uh, Canmore kind of snuck through in that first round, knocking off uh, heavily favored Camrose. 
And uh, up north, it's been Spruce Grove swept White Court, uh, Fort Mac, 4-1 over Drayton Valley. So those ones weren't really close. So then the North uh, finals are decided already. And uh, so we'll see who comes out of that Okotoks Drumheller. Again, I'd have to put my money on Drumheller. Uh, or sorry, on Okotoks. Okotoks. And, yeah, Okotoks and Brooks probably in that South final. And, uh, you know, we'll go from there. It's some great series. And hopefully Okotoks can give Brooks a battle. Does this benefit the AJ to have more of a break before May? Or would you rather see your playoff run get into – you know, early May, so you don't have that much of practice time or, you know, off time before you get to the Centennial? Yeah, there's two ways of looking at it, I guess. But probably, I mean, if you just had a week or so is nice. I mean, if you got any nagging injuries and give your players some rest, it'd be an ideal situation. So I'm not sure how much time they're going to end up uh, left over with, but you don't certainly want too much. And uh, the boys start thinking about golf and other things versus hockey. So we can't think about golf just yet here. We still have about a foot or two of snow in some places, but where it is really heating up, it's the East Division. Like we talked just off camera just a second ago, Wayne. It's hard to distinguish when you have 10 of 11 teams potentially in a playoff run here. And like you said, that 10th place team could very well finish in a sixth spot with remaining games left. Now the first five spots in both divisions – are set up already. I mean, five of eight spots are already taken. Look specifically at the East. You have the Ice, the Kings, the Rebels, the Warriors, and the Blades already locked up. Mm -hmm. Like you look at six, seven, eight, when you have the Hurricanes, the Broncos, and the Kings in that sixth spot, you're Prince Albert Raiders. I know you got a little bit of a little sentiment with that team. We won't, <laughs> we've discussed that before, but they're only two points out. Do you right. see any of those teams sitting out potentially moving into the playoff run? Well, it's going to be a battle. It's too tight to call. I mean, obviously, if I'm being a homer, I'm going to go with the Raiders, and obviously that's who I'm pulling for, right? But, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of teams in there. Swift Currents in the running. They've played, I think, two or three games more than most of the teams, and so they're they're four points ahead of Prince Albert, and they hold that last spot. But, you know, the uh, Pats are right on the doorstep of uh, the Raiders, as are uh, Calgary Hitman. And uh, so, again, it's going to be a battle. Uh, between those uh, four or five teams, only one of them is going to make it. And you and I talked before we went on air, the fact in the, the Western Conference, uh, any of those teams battling for that eighth spot would actually be sitting in sixth spot in the Western Division. And uh, the, or sorry, the Western Conference in the Western Conference, uh, they only have 10 teams and eight of those 10 teams are going to make it. So certainly the bottom teams there are a lot weaker than in the East Division. And, uh, you know, there's 12 teams in the Eastern Conference and only eight of those teams are going to make it. So it's going to be four uh, on the sidelines watching the playoffs. Is there a way you think you could revamp or redo this playoff format for the Western Hockey League? Or do you see any solution besides having just an East, West, and a South division? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I guess uh, we got to cut the Western, or sorry, the Western Hockey League uh, uh, some slack, I guess, because when they're making this plan, uh, COVID was still rampant, so I don't think they wanted to do any crossovers and stuff. But, you know, I'm always a big fan of having wild cards. And that way, you know, you kind of balance things out uh, if one division is stronger than the other. Um, so that's about the only thing I could think. But again, you know, when these decisions were made, there was COVID. So, again, uh, makes sense. But I would think next year, just based on, you know, seeing what's happening this year, I'm sure the Eastern teams are going to be raising that at the league meeting and saying, hey, we got to change this format a little bit so the best teams actually get into the playoffs. Absolutely. I mean, like you said, like that eighth place team in the West would be finishing or this, like you said, the eighth place team in the East would be finishing sixth in the West. And there's, yeah. I mean, obviously there's parity that happens each and every year with ebbs and flows of a roster and how rosters will trade and ramp up and based on, you know, how they performed the year previous. But looking at that six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I mean, even you can't deny, I mean, when you have someone like Connor Bedard sitting in Regina that just would love to make playoffs after what he did in the bubble last year. Certainly you can't count the Regina Pats out at all. And even the teams above them. Yeah, no, the, the, they'll be a contender, but you know, I think what's going to come down is the, the relative strength of the schedule that they play. And, you know, uh, the Raiders were in Winnipeg on the weekend, played back to back. And obviously the Winnipeg is playing very well and all they're healthy now. So they're tough. And uh, I think they mentioned that the ice plays the Pats three times. And so that's going to be three tough games for the Pats. And I don't know what the rest of their schedule is like, but, you know, that's really what it's going to come down to. All those teams are close. 
Uh, there's some interlocking games. I know uh, the Raiders play the Broncos a couple of times, uh, and I think they play the Pats a couple of times. So those are big games uh, that, you know, four pointers. And then you add into the other teams that they got to play. And seeing as the Pats play the ice three times, I mean, that, I, I don't know that I'd favor them at this point in time, just based on that alone. Do you rest players if you're on the ice of the Oil Kings? Well, and that's the, the problem. You know, sometimes late in the season, if you got first or second locked down, do you rest some of your guys going into the playoffs? And then you're, you know, the team is playing a weaker team. So, you know, uh, it's going to be hard to say. I mean, if any of the players got nagging injuries, yeah, you rest them. But if they're healthy, I think you, you run with them. And, uh, you know, again, listening to Brian Munns in the play by play on the weekend there in Winnipeg, uh, you know, he kept reinforcing that I don't think anybody wants to play the Prince Albert Raiders in the first round. So it's going to be between the ice and uh, the Oil Kings. And uh, the Raiders have had relatively good success. And I think the most success of any teams in the Western Hockey League against those two teams. Uh, and again, he kind of mentioned on the fact it's tough to go into Prince Albert. It's a hostile environment. Uh, uh, the boards are rock hard. The glass is like a wall. Uh, when you hit that glass, you don't bounce or it doesn't flex back. It's uh, like hitting concrete. So uh, not many people want to go into that building. Lots of heating up going on in the junior hockey playoffs in the Western Canada, which is great to see. And certainly a lot of the teams that are still playing in the U18s and the CSSHL that have just finished off are looking forward to next month, early in May, May 6th through 8th. It's a uh, exposure camp that you were a part of last year. Mm -hmm. Uh Tell us a little bit what you experienced last year in the Western Canada Hockey Exposure Camp and what's expected this year for players, spectators, and yourself and organizations looking to fulfill rosters. Well, well first of all, I mean, it, it, when I went there last year, it was the first time I'd been there. Uh, probably one of the best showcases I've ever attended, and I've attended a lot of showcases. Uh, just extremely well run in a beautiful uh, arena there, the Seven Nations, I believe is what it is, uh, arena beautiful facility with two side-by-side -side rinks and you know Terry Braun the organizer of this tournament does a really good job setting it up making sure things stay on time which is critical and uh, you know for the scouts that are all there and there's literally I think a couple hundred scouts potentially be there like every junior B every junior A team some WHL teams uh, some AAA organizations prep schools will be there and Terry puts together an unbelievable scout package basically it's an inch thick uh, with a, like a, you know, a full profile on every player. It's got phone number, email information, which is often hard for scouts to, to get that information. And so, you know, I was watching games there, see a player like I would literally text the, the player or the uh, parent and say, hey, can you meet me after the game? I'd like to chat to you and you, they'd come up and meet you. And so that was really, really good from that perspective. And uh, like I say, I think it's a great showcase that any player that's looking to get exposure to those higher levels uh it's a great place to go and uh you know i think you guys have got some exciting news that they're going to improve it even more this year and i'll let you know AST, astv looking forward to being there may 6 through 8 at seven Oak nations there yourself will be there as trailblazer hockey as well as the several other hundred scouts and teams and organizations what is the main takeaway for these players do you think when going to these showcase and exposure camps once their season is over what is important to them to make sure that you know they are still you know not playing at their highest, but also showing off their best talents. Well, I mean, it's like some of the things that we've talked about, and uh, you know, in past shows about you know what scouts look for. And we had that webinar recently of Trailblazer Hockey, where Ryan Ginter kind of went into detail some of the intangibles that maybe many players and parents don't think about, uh, such as your mannerisms on the ice type thing and how hard you work and how well you treat your teammates and stuff are important things that uh, they look for and has nothing to do with if you've been off the ice for, uh, you know, two or three or four weeks type thing. So, you know, it's important you're, you show that you're a good team out, teammate out there, that you work hard. And pretty much everybody's going to be in the same boat as you. They're going to have been off the ice maybe for a little bit. And a lot of these guys skate year round anyway. So, uh, I think we're going to see some great action, just like I seen there last year. We're excited to be a, a bigger part of it this year and sponsoring the MVP awards and stuff. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a great weekend. And, uh, you know, any players, like I say, looking for that extra exposure, I would highly uh, suggest they check into that. May 6th through 8th, Western Canada Hockey Exposure Camp will be there. Trailblazer support and sponsoring the MVPs, as we said already. ASTV will be there with not only coverage of the weekend but we're going to have some player profiles as well as we move closer to the date some of our uh some of the players that are already on that list 
There's over 300 players perhaps going to be attending this exposure camp. There are spots available, and we're going to have Terry Braun on Thursday to kind of give us some more details on how to get involved as a player and as a potential organization. Wayne, it's always great to chat with you Tuesday nights. Really enjoy our discussion, and I know you're going to be watching the Raiders a little more closely these upcoming weeks. I think there's, what, five, eight, seven, eight games left in the season? I think six games, and they got a big uh, set this weekend. They play uh, Brandon, I think, Friday, and the Regina Pats on Saturday. So uh, we're heading up there to catch both those games. So uh, looking forward to it. be some great hockey, and the stands are filling up. Have a couple cold ones, and uh, cheer the boys on. I'm sure you'll be repping a jersey or two, I'm sure, Wayne Kozier. Thanks for joining me as well. Drive safe, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next week. Thanks, Leo. Up next is going to be our friend Gordy Tomlinson from Pilot Mountain Hockey Academy. We're going to talk about playing in April. Yes, the boys, U15, U17, still have tournaments to play. Stay with us on the ice. Welcome to Pilot Mountain Hockey Academy, your world-class academic and hockey training facility created to maximize each student's athletic and academic potential. Blackjack Stewart Arena, home of the Buffalo, is inside the 46,000-square-foot complex, as well as a curling rink and other facilities. The students have a unique combination of successful, well-rounded education at Pilot Mount Collegiate Institute and the professional hockey training in an encouraging community. The years of experience of on-ice coaching propel our students to the next level, both mentally and physically, in a professional environment. Joining us here on part two of On the Ice, Gordy Tumbleson, Pilot Mountain Hockey Academy, Buffaloes. Welcome to the show, Gordy. Great to see you. How have you been so far today? Hey, Theo. Uh, great. I uh, just looked outside, though, and I saw all the white stuff back again. So we've had spring, summer, and we're back to the hockey season, I guess. Here we are. You know what? As Speaking of which, I saw a wonderful picture of you from a good friend of ours, Scott Taylor, putting out for us with you wearing a goalie mask and long, flowing hair. Uh, I want to say from ninth, circa 1974-ish, maybe. Yeah, uh, you, still have, you still have that mask. Yep, uh, I do. I, yes, I do. That's awesome. Yep. How many pucks did you take to the brain that summer for that winter? Um, not that many. Uh, the guys didn't shoot high then. It, it was more for deflections and whatnot. So, yeah, you didn't take as many as they do today. Uh, there's a lot more respect in hockey than, than we find on the kids today, but uh, not too many. Well, <laughs> respect. Let's leave it. We'll just leave that one there. We'll transition and segue into our first section here, right. talking with you about the Pilot Mound crew. CSSHL action ended last week. Not the greatest of endings, but that does not mean that this spring mm -hmm. break is not for naught because two of the three teams are playing in April and it's pretty significant tournaments. Let's talk about the U15s first because they're heading out – Easter weekend down to Blaine, Minnesota to play in a tournament in Minnesota. When was that organized and how important is that for these young players to get into showcasing their talents south of the border? Well, first, in fact, all three of our teams are playing in April, so that's uh, the girls have oh, some additional games. I didn't yeah. see an addition to the U the female program. That's great yeah. too, awesome. Yeah. But uh, as far as the U15s, uh, yeah, it's, it's first of all, it's the first time we've been to the States in two years. So that's um, a, a big deal. And this, this is the organizing of this, uh, uh, Kyle Nixon and, and Danny Carrolls and the, and the organizing group uh, on the new 15s have been working at this for a couple of months now. So I think they, they in fact registered in January. So uh, the, you know, they're looking forward to this and, and boy, it's a great opportunity for the kids to, uh, again, you said it, showcase their skills and, and whatnot and uh, get a look and see what the uh, kids down in the States can do and, and how good they are and, and uh, the high, check in the hospitality and get to see a different city. And that's all part of the deal at, at when you go to an academy and, and particularly ours when we're just close to Minneapolis and, and get a chance to go down there. So, yeah, this is a really good big deal for those kids. Absolutely. And that tournament happens Easter weekend in the middle of April. Before that, the weekend before, the U-17 mail program is heading out to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And they're playing in a tournament out there, IASA. Give us some details on how that is going to look and if that will look any different to play 
that they would have experienced in the CSSHL. Well, I, I think this is a, a series of games against the ISA team. I, I'm not sure it's a tournament. Uh, uh, the uh, we've we've developed a, a nice relationship with this brand new franchise in the CSSHL. Uh, uh, you know, we we have a number of Indigenous kids in our teams. We had uh, we've probably had 25 percent of our kids have been Indigenous right from day one, and that's just because they're good players and and uh, they've showed up to play, and and we're and we're glad to have them. Um, and so um, we've, we've kind of formed a bit of a, a, a you know, a back and forth with them and, and a nice relationship. So this is an extra series for the teams to continue on playing a little bit beyond uh, the, the regular schedule. Uh, there were some games that were missed. Uh, we had a, we did have a series with them that was missed. So this is kind of a makeup series, but it'll be fun and it'll be extra games. And that's what the kids want to do. And, and, and why wouldn't they? So here we go. We're going up to Saskatoon and have some fun. Absolutely. And you also mentioned that there is a U18 female weekend uh, on the deck as well in April. Yeah, the um, the girls have signed up for a showcase in, uh, and that's just recently signed up. So yeah, 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 a showcase in Winnipeg uh, with a number of teams from the area. So again, uh, more hockey for them. Uh, we The girls do have a couple of exhibition games against St. Mary's as well uh, that have not been scheduled yet before then. So somewhere in the middle of April, we'll, they'll play their games those two games and uh, those were those two games were weathered out uh, back in uh, January and February. So, so a lot, a lot with a lot of other things that were weathered out in Manitoba uh, over that period of time. But yeah, a big series, a big big event in Winnipeg. To get another showcase, and that's what academy hockey is all about: is is getting the kids out, letting the scouts see who they are, and uh, and um, we we hope that we're able to place all of our players. Uh, that are graduating as uh, as uh, seasons come to an end. Certainly, it's important for the players to show off their best interests and as well, if they are graduating, to find that next progression in their student-athlete career. But it's also just as important for a recruiting aspect for the academy itself because not only do they have to start recruiting for three teams, there's now four teams to worry about, Gordy. And not worry per se, but you have an extra 18 kids to start putting together a team and a roster plus the coaches and whatnot, and all of those, you know, behind the scene things that have to occur. How important are these showcases as well for the teams per se and their recruiting efforts for the upcoming fall? Well, they're, everything is, every time we see a game or, or watch, or you can watch on ASTV or hockey TV or whatever, it's important. Uh, we're, we're always taking notes. Every coach is taking notes uh, all of the time. You're, you're always looking for players to, fill your roster or your coaching friends rosters in your, in your home team uh, uh, building, et cetera. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's ongoing. It's 24 seven. We, you know, we finished the season last week and we're right into recruiting. Well, we've been in recruiting anyway, but we're right into recruiting. We do have another team. We're going to have a, a U18 coach and hopefully we'll have an announcement uh, by the end of the week on that. So we're really, we're really sort of pumped on that one. But uh, I'll mums the word until we get down there. But um, yeah, we're we're uh, we're always looking at players and players. We have a I've got a young friend down in um, in Florida, Austin Lotz, who plays uh, goalie for Birmingham Bulls in the SPHL, and he happens to live in Jacksonville, uh, Florida. And uh, lo and behold, in Fort Myers, in the middle of April, once his season is done. There's a, um, uh, a female college tournament down there, and, and we're hoping that Austin's going to have time to be able to be our scout down there and take a look at some of those things. So, you know, it, it's ongoing. We're finding people to take a look at, uh, at players, and, and, we're, and, uh, and we're looking and, and, uh, and we're placing kids at the same time. Fingers crossed, Gordy, is this off season going to be a little bit more ability-wise to bring in players from mm -hmm. all over North America and even the world compared to what we've had these last couple of years, yeah, we got strangled out last year. I mean, we're we're you know in a in not we're not in a big center, which which really is easy for for um, you know the teams like the Rink and and the Nax and Edge and whatnot are that are playing in, in Delta, playing in big cities where there's a lot of kids, and so they've you know they've automatically got players available to them. You know whether they get them or not is another issue, but nonetheless they've got access to a lot of really good players. That is not the case at Pilot Mound. We really have to kind of go out and source our players. Uh, we had seven goalies, uh, uh, six not from Manitoba. 
um, you know, <laughs> to, you know, so, so we, um, uh, you know, we, we look everywhere. We had a boy from uh, Brussels, Belgium. We had a, I have a boy from Taiwan, as we've said before, we have kids from uh, Nunavut and, and uh, Rankin Inlet and, and all over Canada. So, but to get them here is tough when you've got a, a you know, a worldwide pandemic going on and parents are a little bit sh- afraid that, you know, they're sending them somewhere where they haven't got uh, easy access to them. Although, you know, social media and, and phones and cell phones and all that make it FaceTime, make it real easy. But at the end of the day, it was really hard on us. Uh, and, and people like, uh, Notre Dame and uh, and uh, you know, PHA uh, out in uh, uh, Karensport, uh, they just you know kids just wouldn't show up. I mean, they just, they just parents just wouldn't let them go, and 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 rightly so. You know, I mean that's everybody's health is important. So this year, the, the you know the borders will be open. We we trust and hope, and people are vaxxed and and uh, and uh, we'll have access to. We've got a bunch of scouts out now in in all provinces in most of the northern states. And then access to all sorts of other um, online uh, scouting uh, material and whatnot, and 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 whatnot. So we're, we're at websites. So we're uh, we're checking these out. We've got four months to put our our team together, our teams together, and and, and we started uh, on Thursday night last week. That's great news to hear. So like you said it's always ongoing. It's never a dull moment in Gordy Tomlinson's world, right? <laughs> You're there. You go. Speaking of not dull moments at all, we've talked last week about the upcoming uh, dorms that are hopefully going to be ready by the end of next or the end of the end of the summer and ready for this upcoming season. Can you give us a bit of an update on how those are looking as well as some of the other amenities that we may not know about when a player becomes part of the academy? Yeah, the, well, the dorms, uh, the, the skin is on the outside. So we've got the building up, the frame is up, the skin is on, the roof is on. And we're starting to work on the insides, the guts of the thing. That, of course, that's a lot of work and and whatnot. So, yeah, we're going to be pushed. To, uh, but uh, you know, Tammy Collins, our our owner and major shareholder and and general contractor and bus driver and do it all guy, uh, tells us that uh, he'll be ready to open up the doors come the end of August. And of course, we're planning on that. So those amenities will be there. We'll have another new, brand new dressing room uh, for our U18 guys. Uh, that'll be important. And uh, we've always got additions going on. We have some ASTV additions going on uh, in the building. We're 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 going to be uh, so we hope to be affixing some cameras that'll be full time in the building. So we'll be able to do all sorts of neat things. Whether the the Glenn can drive from Morris to uh, to uh, Pilot Mound or not, uh, we can we can still you know broadcast the games, uh, which we did a bunch of them. Uh, I think the the kids did them. Uh, uh, from home, you know, uh, Seth and and and, and Corey and uh, and Graham. So yeah, so that that's going to be neat. Uh, other things that are there's always something being fixed and repaired. We got a big uh, a green wall going up, so we can kind of show off some neat uh, backgrounds, you know, for some of our uh, our, uh, our our things like that. And our, our medical situation is always improving. Uh, you know, equipment, uh, fitness room equipment's always get growing. So yeah, there's there's things happening on a on a daily basis that. Uh, it's hard to keep track of sometimes, but uh, yeah, we're we're looking forward to some some really nice new things, and uh, being ready for our new group uh, come August. Come August, it's, it's going to fly by, just like summer. It always flies by. We never have enough summer, Gordy, as you and I will always say. Uh, thank you for joining me tonight. Really do appreciate the updates in April as well as the amenities. Check out the website pilotmounthockeyacademy.com where you'll find all the information. And soon an extra tab for that U18 team that's going to be popping up with some announcements. Great to hear you guys have been looking and hopefully you found your new head coach for the fourth team in the academy. Gordy Tomlinson, thanks so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Theo. Look forward to doing it again. I will see you. Have a great week. You too. And that is Gordy Tomlinson with the Pilot Mountain Hockey Academy joining us here. Part two in ASTV's On the Ice. I'd like to thank our sponsors once again, Doak Spoke Fuels. Pilot Mountain Hockey Academy, Toby Hockey, and Case Financial Group. Join us Thursday as we have the organizer for the Western Canada Hockey Exposure Camp, Mr. Terry Braun, joining me. He is going to explain uh, how that camp, that showcase exposure camp became available, who's involved, how many players, defensemen, forwards, and scouts, and goalies will be attending, and the waiting list that will be available to those players Still looking to get involved. We'll have that information for you as well. Thursday night here on the ice ASTV again. Thanks for joining us here. Keep bringing more goodness to the greatness as always. 
keep your friends and your neighbors very well taken care of and take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Have a great rest of the week and we will see you on Thursday. Bye-bye for now.